<sighs> take a couple deep breaths. Says that take a couple deep breaths and then. Hello, my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina, and my. Self and my dear brethren come out here on Friday nights to bring to you the gospel of salvation, to lift up and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to tell you and warn you about the wrath of God which is to come, but to tell you that there is an ark of salvation that's been prepared in the sight of all peoples, and His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One. He is the King of glory. And my friends, we are here to tell you about what He has done, about His character, and about His willingness to save those who come to Him in truth. We're also out here not to belittle sin, not to sweep it under the rug, but to talk about sin the way the Bible talks about sin. To describe sin and its consequences to you. To warn you that sin will cause you to lose your soul. And my friends, I want to state this at the beginning, at the opening of the gate, that we are doing this for two reasons. Firstly, because we love you and we care for your souls and where you're going to go when you die. And secondly, which is towering much greater and much higher above the first reason, and that is to bring God glory. That is to exalt the Creator. To exalt the One who has formed you in your mother's womb. To exalt the One who sustains you by His sovereign hand. To give glory to the One who spake and everything came into being. My friends, we are here to bring the triune God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the Spirit of the Prophets, we're here to bring Him glory. And so my friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this evening is out of the book of Romans, beginning in, ver in chapter 1, verse 18. And the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. My friends, we are here to warn you about that wrath this verse speaks of. We're here to tell you about that so that you could be saved from it. That you could be rescued from that judgment. Thank you, brother. That's right. Let's keep going. All right, thank you. I'll turn you on just the bottom. Let's keep speaking that you could be rescued because Christ is the rescuer. My friends, see, you are, clo you are clothed in sin, in the garments of sin, and you need cleansing. And there's only cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ. There's only cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. The, the Lamb that was slain at the cross of Calvary. In fact, Scripture says that Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Dear friends, the cross was not some at-the-moment decision in the mind of God, but it was something that God had ordained from the foundation of this very world. And praise be to Him that Christ not only died, but rose, and He is alive today. And if I could title this message, it would simply be, I would title it very simply, The Wrath of God. There is so little preaching today, my friends, in churches, in pulpits, at conferences, on the television. In fact, I would say there's a total absence of it. On the preaching of God's wrath. That God hates sin. That God has a vengeance against the sinner. My friends, I myself am a pastor, so I stand in this position. And I say this out of experience. And I say this because I know what it is like to see people who claim to be pastors who don't warn people about sin and righteousness and judgment, who do not warn sinners of the wrath which is to come. My friends, it would, it would break my heart to know on the day of judgment that you were eternally lost and that I had not warned you 
that I had not warned you that God's wrath would grind you to dust. My friends, it would be so unloving for me to just go about my life and not tell you. In fact, if I saw you walking into a burning building down the street here in Greenville, I would be obligated at that moment to cry out to you like a fanatic and warn you that the building would bring about your destruction, that you would be burned alive in that building. My friends, and I, at that moment, I wouldn't care what you thought about me or if you were offended by my pleas. Oh, my friends, I would do it because I cared for you. In fact, all of you who are in your right mind would do it. You would warn somebody if they were going to walk into a building that was about to collapse at any moment. And so, my friends, there is something much more important than a building that is going to fall upon people. There is m something much more weighty and much more terrifying and much more fear-inducing, and that is God's wrath against sin. Oh, my friends, so many people have a false perception of the God of Scripture. They say, excuse me, brother, they say that He Himself is like some cosmic genie in a bottle, that He is a, a grandfather in the sky who has this long white beard and He just zaps people with blessings as they, as they ask Him to. And He cares nothing about holiness or judgment. He cares nothing about the vindication of His own righteousness. Such a God is an idol. And my friends, we know that one of the first commandments God gave was to not make a false God in your own mind. A God that fits your own passions. A God that fits your own desires. Thank you. A God that fits your own lusts. My friends, that is a grievous sin. And so as we go through this verse, I want to direct you to the Scriptures and see what they have to say concerning who God is. To see what they say concerning the Gospel message and the way of salvation. That you might be eternally redeemed. That you might be reconciled to the Almighty. For God is abounding in loving kindness, yet, as Exodus 34 says, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And the only way the guilt of the guilty can be removed is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So just a note on the context of this verse, the Apostle Paul has just in the past two verses established his thesis statement for the book of Romans. He has established what he is going to spend the rest of the book unfolding and unpacking. He is going to explain this gospel truth he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And so he says, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my book that I'm writing here explaining. And so he starts off with the bad news. He starts off in verse 18 immediately talking about God's wrath. See, my friends, in order for you to understand the mercy and the kindness and the love that God has manifested, that God has exposed and shown in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you must understand and you must gr um, grasp the, the depth of your sin and grasp the depth of your depravity and the depth of that in light of the holiness of God. You must grasp what we would say is the bad news that you are eternally hopeless and lost. Friends, you must come to that understanding so that Christ would be precious to you. So that Christ would be glorious to you. If I came out here and just told you all of the good news and did not preface it by explaining the bad news, the good news would make no sense. If I simply said, well, Jesus died for you, my friend, or Jesus died for sinners, just believe on Him and you'll be saved. Well, you'll ask me, safe from what? Safe from what? I don't need salvation. I'm a good person. I live a great life. But my friends, if I take the time and explain to you how you have offended a holy God and you have, you have kindled His wrath against you and that you are living in your sin and you will be eternally damned for it, 
and you are brought to the point of helplessness and hopelessness, borderline depression, then Christ will be of great value to you. Christ will be of infinite worth to you, my friends. And I call you that because I care for you. And so let's begin in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Notice he does not say the love of God. Notice he does not say the kindness of God. Notice he does not say the mercy of God. But simply, the wrath of God. See, my friends, the word, the first word that ought to come out of someone's mouth when they are declaring the gospel is for. And then they ought to follow that up with the words, for the wrath of God. Because it's all starting with that, my friends. It's starting with a grasping and an understanding of the character of the Almighty. This is all throughout the Bible. It is on practically every page. In fact, especially in the Old Testament, God raised up prophet after prophet after prophet. And in almost every instance of each of the prophets being raised up, God gave them a message. What was it? Was it a message of restoration? Was it a message of reconciliation? Actually, no. Most of the time, it was a message of damnation. A message of wrath. A message of judgment. It was not that they were preaching trying to comfort the people. But they were trying to preach and cause the people to weep. To wail and to mourn over their sin. In light of their offense before God. In fact, Psalm 5 says this in verse 4. The psalmist is praying to God. David is, is lifting up praise to the Most High. And he says in verse 4, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. Friends, how many of you these days think yourself that you can just continue in sin and God will, will give you the thumbs up? God is just going to wink at sin. And He's going to say, Yeah, it's okay. I know you tried your best. My friends, that is not the God of Scripture. In fact, he continues. He says, no evil dwells in you. See, the reason God has a wrath against sin is because He Himself is good. He Himself is pure. He Himself is refined. He Himself is glorious. He is separate. He is set apart. He is not like anyone or anything we have ever seen before. In fact, through the prophet Isaiah, God told the Israelites that His ways are not their ways and His thoughts are not their thoughts. Human, carnal people, fleshly people who are dead in their sin cannot grasp the things of God. They cannot grasp the fact that God is a righteous and pure God. But instead, they will always default to making a false God who suits their desires. But listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. And now that is a hard truth out of Scripture. My friends, it is, it is enumerated throughout the Old and New Covenant that God has a love for sinners. I will never detract from that. But I must say this, that God also hates the sinner that He has a hatred upon the ungodly. If I simply covered this up and did not tell you about this, I would be unfaithful to the text, unfaithful to the full counsel of God. In fact, in verse 6, the psalmist really explains how this hatred manifests itself. How does God's hatred against the sinner manifest itself? Well, verse 6, you destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. And that's simply a synonym for hate. He's a, he's a, he's a, he abhors the wicked. Oh, my friends. And the only way this hatred can be removed is through the blood of the Lamb. It's through the, the saving blood of Christ. The cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Dear friends, do not lose your souls. Do not be eternally damned by God. Instead, receive His offer of mercy today. Don't harden your heart any longer. Don't resist any longer. Don't run any longer. Do not flee any longer. Instead, do a 180, a total turnaround, and run in the exact opposite direction. Because when you do that, when you turn to the Lord, He says that the one who comes to Him, Jesus said, He will by no means cast out. The one who humbles himself under the mighty hand of God will receive mercy and grace in time of need. He will receive eternal life. But notice, you must fulfill the condition of calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Psalm 11. This is not just in one little part. This is all, as I said, throughout the scriptures. The the Hi. God bless you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In Psalm 11, in verse 4, listen to the words of David again. He writes, The Lord in His holy temple, the, excuse me, the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. In other words, he's saying God judges the wicked. God has judgment reserved for them, and that's why he says that the one who loves violence his soul hates. And so that really leads me into the next part. Going back into verse 18 of Romans 1, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's revealed from heaven. In other words, God is seated in heaven and He's revealing that wrath against sinners. My friends, it's a terrifying reality to consider the fact that mil millions of people every year are thrown into the pits of hell, are lost eternally. My friends, even today, 160,000 people will die. By the end of this 24-hour cycle, there will be 20, uh, 160,000 people who have stepped out of this world and into the next. My friends, we are on the precipice of eternity. We are on the cliff of eternity, dear friends. And I care enough to warn you. I care enough to say, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from your sins. For He Himself said that if you look to Him for eternal life, He will redeem you from your sins. If you look to Christ, He says, if you look to Him, you will live. And so, my friends, I say, look, all the ends of the earth, both young and old, male and female, it does not matter, my friends. It does not matter who you are, or where you come from, or what, how much money you make. Christ is for all. He has died for all different kinds of people. So it is revealed from heaven, and then notice what it says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Dear friends, God has not only just said that He's holy in His law, in His, in His Word, but he has, he has spelled out His holiness in His law. He has revealed to us, to the fullest extent, how righteous He is. For He Himself said, You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not disobey your parents. You shall not fornicate. You shall not commit adultery. Why does God command us to do these things? Because He Himself is not a liar, is not a thief. He is not unfaithful. See, my friends, the, the, the commands of God are to show us two things. They are like a mirror. We see two reflections in the mirror of God's law. Firstly, we see the reflection of God's perfection. The reflection of His righteous character. And then secondly, we see the reflection of our filth and our iniquity. Oftentimes, because I'm young, I'm sure this will change when I get older, but I'll wake up in the morning and I feel great. And then I will walk into the restroom and look into the mirror and see that my, my hair looks crazy and I look like I need a shower. See, my friends, I thought I looked good. I thought I was good, but then I looked into the mirror and I saw that I was filthy. I saw that I was... was dead in sin, that I was dead in iniquity and transgression. Oh my friends, the Bible does say God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. 
And when you sow the mark, when you mock the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're only sowing damnation for yourself. Sir, what you need to do is repent and believe the gospel. It's interesting, no one will ever actually offer to have an intelligent conversation, which we actually are offering to do. In fact, we set up a microphone to my right hand side. It's, it's live right now. If you have a question or you have anything you would like to say concerning God or Scripture or the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you just want to say something and, or maybe contend with me and disagree with me, I invite you to use this live microphone. That actually gave me a good occasion to say that. So that thing's on. Come up, use it. But certainly, my friends, as I was saying, God gives those commands to show us our sin and to show us His character. So my friends, my question for you is this. You who are young, you who are old, you who are rich, you who are poor, I want to ask you this. You who are religious and non-religious, do you keep God's commands? And herein lies the great dilemma. Herein lies the problem. We cannot keep the law. We cannot keep the commandments. This is our problem. It's not in God. It's not in His law. It's not in who He is. It's in the fact that we... Oh, God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not in Him. The issue is us, my friends. Look at your life. Ask yourself, have I ever lied? Have I ever stolen? Have I ever committed adultery? And many of you would be quick to say, of course I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and says, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. My friends, God sees your thoughts. He sees the mind. He sees your heart. And He sees that you are wicked, that you are dead in your sins. In fact, Genesis 6, 5 says, God looked down from heaven and saw that every intent of the heart of man was to do evil continually. My friends, man is not inherently good. Man is not inherently righteous. I myself, outside of Christ, am inherently evil. In fact, I will say with the Apostle Paul that I am the chief of sinners, but I have been saved by God's amazing, redeeming grace. And my friends, that's what I desire for you. Ask yourself, have I ever committed idolatry? Have I ever worshipped anything besides the Creator or perhaps created a false God who suits my desires? Ask yourself, have I ever disobeyed my parents? For that is another one of God's commands. So let's just review. We're liars, we're thieves, we're blasphemers, we're adulterers, we're idolatrous, we're disobedient, rebellious. My friends, there's more I could go through. But suffice it to say, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. My friends, hell's fires are hot. Hell's fires are hot for the ungodly, ready to consume the wicked, ready to consume the evildoer. We're without hope. No righteous deeds can merit our right standing before God. A sinner thinking they can make themselves right with God by their works is like a filthy, condemned murderer here in Greenville County trying to argue his own righteousness before a judge. Imagine that for a moment, my friends. Transport yourself into a courtroom. Could a, could a murderer who has been convicted and found guilty, could they argue, well, I have given to charity, Judge. I have helped an old lady cross the street. I've given to the Red Cross. Therefore, I'm okay. My goods outweighed the bad, right? It does not work like that. It doesn't matter how much good you've done. It doesn't matter how much righteous things you have done. You have guilt before the Creator. You have iniquity before God, and your sin will damn you. And that's why the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 5 that if you sin, you are worthy of being thrown into the lake of fire. You're worthy of going to the place that He says is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, the moans of hell, the cries of eternal damnation never stop, dear friends. Hell never ends. My friends, the, the screams and moans of the damned, let your mind go and think about that for a moment. Let, let hell's fires make you sober in your thinking. Consider eternity and the fact that you are standing on the cliff that any moment God could say, stand before me, and you will be found guilty. So what are we going to do? We can't do anything. But I want to lay before you the hope of the Gospel, and it is this. The Bible says in Galatians 4.4, 4, 
that when the fullness of time came, praise be to God that He sent forth His Son, born under the law, born of a virgin, Christ the Lord. He is the good news. He is the gospel. He is the way. He is the King. He is the eternal life of all those who trust in Him. He came and fulfilled God's law. And He was stretched upon the cross of Calvary. He was abandoned by His disciples. He was, he was forsaken. He was beat and whipped and mocked and spat upon. He was given a crown of thorns. And He was nailed to that tree there. As Galatians 3 says, that cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Oh, my friends, He was crushed under the wrath of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 53.10 that it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. He cried out on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? On the cross, God treated His Son as if He's committed the sins of all His people. God treats Jesus as if He's committed the sins that I've committed. God treats Jesus as if He's broken the laws that I've broken. God treats Him as a sinner, though He is sinless. God treats Him as though He was filthy, though He was pure. God treats him as though he hated God, though he loved him in his perfect life. The God-man, the creator of heaven and earth, and the upholder of all things on the cross. Creator dying for the creation. See, my friends, it's like this. Take your mind back to the courtroom. So the murderer is found guilty here in Greenville. And they are put on death row, simply awaiting the punishment. Year after year goes by, and they are waiting for the day in which that lethal injection shall be given, and they will die. But my friends, we are in that same manner. We are just simply waiting on death row, just awaiting the final day of punishment. But praise God, someone comes in. God Himself steps into our place and takes our spot on death row and is slain for us. God Himself dies upon the cross. The second person of the Trinity, the one who is described as the eternal Word, crushed under the wrath of God. See, the cross shows us to the great extent God would go to save His people whom He so loves. It shows us how kind God is and how compassionate God is and how gracious God is. But it also shows us how much God hates sin. It shows us that God would go to such an extreme. That God would go to crush His own Son. And you think on the day of judgment you're going to escape? You think God will be impressed with the way you've lived your life? My friends, you are self-deluded. You're self-deluded. God crushed His Son. Do not think He will spare you. But my friends, if your trust is in the fact that He crushed His Son, then He will spare you. See, my friends, because He spared not His Son, He can spare His people. Because He, did, he crushed His Son, He can withhold His crushing upon His own people. God can administer forgiveness upon the elect because Christ died for their sin. In fact, listen to the words of Romans, Romans 5. The Apostle Paul in chapter 5 further enumerates this. He further explains this in verse, let's see, in verse 6. Listen to these words. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to verse 9. Much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. My friends, are you fearful of God? Do you fear the Almighty? Do you want to escape God's wrath? Then trust in the One who was crushed under His wrath. And I can assure you, my friends, this day that Jesus Christ did not remain in that tomb. He did not remain in that grave. But as all four of the Gospels chronicle and as the Apostles taught and preached and as Christian men and women throughout the histories of the, of, of the ages of the church have believed, and that is that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He is alive, my friends. He is the life to the fullest extent. Death could not hold Him. It could not hold Him down, my friends. He is alive today. And for those of you who are believers in Him, that brings great comfort to your heart. But those of you who are His enemies, that brings great terror upon your hearts. And it ought to, because He is your enemy. And you are His enemy. 
But the Prince of Peace will not always make war, but instead he offers terms of peace, terms which he enacted in his own blood as he told his disciples the night before he was to be crucified. This is the blood of the covenant, of the new covenant. My friends, he ratified this new covenant with his own blood. And after 40 days, he was exalted into heaven and he is seated there now in celestial glory. He is praised by the angels. He is exalted on high and he is being adored by the angelic hosts. And one day the Bible says in Philippians 2, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue will confess that He is kurios, that He is sovereign, that He is the one who commands the day in which you are born and the day when you will die. He is the one who holds your future within His hands. And that ought to terrify you. Fear the Lord, my friends. Fear God. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom. So, dear friends, the question arises. The question is asked, well, in light of this, what must I do to be saved? If you say to me, if you say to me, Lucas, that Christ has done it all, what do I have to do to make this become personal for me? What do I have to do? Well, to put it very short and simple and sweet, Acts 2.20 says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. My friends, I call you today to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance simply means to flee your sin, to, to mourn over your sin before the Most High, that you've grieved your Creator, to flee your pornography, to flee your drunkenness, to flee your lusts, to flee your selfishness, to flee your worship of sports, your worship of the next television show, to, to flee all of your transgressions. Oh, my friends, God sees your internet browsing history. He sees what your girlfriend does not see. He sees what your wife does not see. He sees what your mother does not see. You may click the delete button, but God remembers it. God takes it into account, friends. In fact, Scripture says that everything will be laid bare before His eyes. And everything that was done in the darkness shall be brought to light on the day of judgment. So repentance is a brokenness and a fleeing from sin. And then secondly, believe. Believe. It's that simple. See, there's two kinds of religions in the world, my friends. Human accomplishment or divine accomplishment. Human confidence or divine confidence. Are you going to trust in yourself or are you going to trust in your religion? Are you going to trust in your own righteousness or in the righteousness of Christ? Are you going to trust in a priest or a pope or a pastor or your prayers? Or are you going to trust upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? My friends, preachers often say in pulpits, you just need a relationship with God. My friends, you have a relationship with God, but it is a broken and a very horrible relationship. It's a relationship of enmity and war. But God is saying, I will make amends. I will show you kindness if you come to me through my son. But what can be said of you if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ this day? What more can I offer to you, friends, if you reject the blood of the Lord? If you trample underfoot the blood of the Lamb of God, which was shed at, cro at the cross of Calvary. Dear friends, do you not see the kindness of God? As, as Romans 2 says, the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Friends, does the mercies of God as they're revealed in His Son not break you of your sin? Does it not break you over the fact that you've offended Him? Does it not move you to want to flee your rebellion? How hard does your heart have to be? How desensitized does your mind have to be in order for you to behold the glorious, the glorious cross of Calvary and still live in your sin? Oh, my friends, let the, cross power, the cross's power change you. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's, that's 1 Corinthians 1.18. So my friends, if you repent and believe the gospel, if you just simply lay hold of the promise of God as it's revealed in the gospel, I now want to lay before you the most glorious part. God from heaven will decree, will, will send forth a decree, and it is a decree of mercy and kindness, and you will be forgiven of all your sins. You will be cleansed of your iniquity. You will be freed from your guilt. Your confidence will be in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be washed from your sins, my friends. You will be washed from your iniquities. Every last one of your sins, there's not one that is too great for the blood of Christ. My friends, there is not one sin that is too evil. There is not one sin that is too wicked. There is not one sin that God is somehow outside, it's somehow outside of His ability 
to save you from. But God will forgive you of your sins. You'll be cleansed. And not only that, but He will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. God will clothe you in the garments of His Son's righteousness. He will treat you as having lived Jesus' life. He will treat you as having done the things Jesus did. As having obeyed the laws that Jesus did. As having pleased Him as Jesus did. See, my friends, that is the exchange of the gospel. He takes my garments of sin, and I get His garments of righteousness. He takes my filth, I get His precious holiness. My friends, is your soul wrapped in the garments of sin or the garments of the righteousness of Jesus Christ? We're on the precipice of eternity where you're, any moment you'll step over that cliff, friends. Where is your confidence? Where is your hope for heaven? Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't lose your soul for your rebellion. Oh, my friends, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You'll be saved from your sins. God will give you the righteousness of Christ and eternally justify you. And you will be saved from this wrath of God that is spoken of here in Romans 1. You will be saved from this judgment that is, that is put forth in this verse. You will be saved from it. For there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. You will be saved from your ungodliness and your unrighteousness. You who are young, remember the Lord. The Bible says, remember the Lord in your youth. You who are old, remember the Lord. Trust in Him. For you are surely closer to the day of death than the, than the youngster. You're surely closer. So I call out to you, you who are young and old, rich and poor, black or white, it does not matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your culture is. Trust in Christ. Flee to Him. Flee to the cross. Oh, my friends, be like the old hymn writer who said, Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to Thee for dress. Helpless come to Thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. You who are believers in the Lord Jesus, I want to address you. Preach the gospel. Live on the gospel. Proclaim the gospel until you die. Do it for the rest of your life to the glory of God. So we've seen here in this text that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and their unrighteousness. But that wrath can be removed. You can be saved from the wrath of God by trusting in the shelter of Christ the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. They are safe. My friends, I want to end off with this note. To end off with this simple charge. To give God the glory. My friends, give God the glory for what He has done in His Son. Give God the glory for what He has done in creating you. In giving you life even this day. To Give God the glory for allowing you to be out here to hear the preaching of the gospel. Give God the glory for the death of Christ, for the resurrection of Christ, for the intercession of Christ, for the glory of Christ. Give God the glory. Oh, come to the Father through Christ Jesus the Son and give Him the glory for the great things He has done. Oh, my friends, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Glory to the triune God, the God of Scripture, the God of glory, the God who is the God from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen.